and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and we have special guest Scott Sion with us from Nibiru, Planet X 2016. Now, this channel has just skyrocketed over the past several months. He has accumulated over 32,000 astute members and subscribers and people that are helping him out finding the infamous Planet X Nibiru, the Wing Destroyer, the Red Kachina Nemesis, the Binary Star, the Dark Star, whatever name you want to put behind this heavenly body that's been talked about for thousands of years. Now, this is also a very controversial subject. I've noticed that during the past year that I've done Leak Project, we've had people from around the world on a wide variety of subjects, and it seems like Planet X and Nibiru is definitely the most controversial. Whether you love it or hate it, you're going to have something to say. And as you guys know, they've been following us here at Leak Project. We have an open platform. We are neutral as we can be on most of the topics. I know you guys know I'm pretty passionate about certain things with vaccines and stuff. But when it comes to Planet X and Nibiru, I am agnostic, which means I just don't no. Uh, do I believe there's a Planet X out there? Yes, absolutely. Do I believe that it's Nibiru? I don't know. I, I don't know. So Scott is going to share some great information with us today. He reached out to us and said, look, I've got some awesome data footage, and we're going to see it here at Leak Project. Scott, it's an honor to speak with you. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex, what's happening, my man? Hey, living the dream. You know, I mean, this is, this is awesome. I love data, and it's great to speak with people like you. So what do you got for us? Well, we have a whole storyline. Um, I mean, this all started for me back in 1989 when I was in college. Uh, I was at the University of Miami, and uh, a professor of mine mentioned this Planet X material way back then. It was just a, a topic of conversation in class. And ever since then, I've been, you know, I've been investigating it. I've been keeping up on it. We had a very large period of time where there was literally no information or very little information. And I was kind of moving on with my life. And then over the past several years, more and more information has been coming out. And, you know, with the uh, with the platforms like YouTube and Facebook, uh, this information has now come out in droves. Uh, YouTube channels, researchers, investigators, whatever you want to call them. So I decided to start listening in. And once I started listening in, and then I started doing my own homework and my own investigations. I started to find that a lot of this material uh, had a lot of credibility to it. And, you know, I started watching, you know, a little bit about the government, the FEMA camps, the underground bunkers, the whole nine yards. I've never been a big fan of, of them, but um, I started investigating all of this myself. And I couldn't come up to any other conclusions other than governments around the world are preparing for something. And I don't think it's nuclear war because there isn't a winner in nuclear war. I mean, I, I came to that conclusion many, many years ago. You know, you, you fire off a nuclear weapon, I fire off a nuclear weapon, and we wipe out the world. So what good comes from it? So I felt that the governments around the world were literally preparing for something. And when I was putting the two and two together... I figured, okay, well, let me get back into this Planet X. And Planet X was basically, you know, the Roman numeral for, for number 10. Uh, it wasn't like the X Factor or the X Files. It was literally the 10th planet, according to Dr. Robert Harrington. And uh, whenever I started getting into Dr. Harrington's research and Carlos Ferrada and many others back in that era, these were incredible men and very intelligent men and I've come to find over this, this past year that there are so many people out there that just want to debunk this information. They, they call Robert Harrington an idiot. He was wrong. Carlos Ferrada, uh, a charlatan, a prophet. He had no idea what he was talking about. His mathematical equations were wrong. So... I respect these men. I respect their research, and I followed some of the research. And um, I started listening to uh, Gil Broussard, who is, uh, an, again, another very intelligent man, biblical scholar in my eyes. And once I started following uh, Gil Broussard's findings in the Bible, and I started putting all of that together, I really started to think, okay, there has to be something there. These timelines that Gill has put together, the timelines of events 
from four or five, six thousand years ago, you know, these ancient people just didn't make this up all over the world. They documented it. And we have the proof, we have the evidence. The Chinese wrote it down and their language hasn't changed in 6,000 years. So the actual writings that Gil Broussard discovered, they were very easy to translate. The language hasn't changed. And uh, I began I began searching and searching, and then I decided to uh, go to YouTube, and um, I felt everyone in this world has the right to know what's going on because, I mean, let's be honest, uh, some of these events with the Earth over the – you know, over the centuries have been catastrophic. Many people have died. And now that we are in modern times, I feel the the destruction will be even more because we are now modern man. We're not ancient man. We have huge cities. We have, you know, utility services underground. I mean, we have big buildings, bridges, and the population of the world is much larger also. And, you know, uh, tens of millions of people are inhabiting the coastlines all around the world. So in the event of anything like this, the possibilities of massive amounts of people dying in the first 24 hours is unbelievable. So I decided to dive in and try to do my part. And believe me, I get nailed left and right every single day for doing what I do. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show and some of the stuff you shared with me off the air, I think is just, it's incredible that you've persevered through that much. Cause a lot of people would just be like, look, I'm done. And I find it fascinating why people get so upset about planet X sometimes, you know, I hear the old, Oh, well, it's a fear mongering thing. And I do see people that use fear tactics to, to profit. And I don't like it. I mean, there's plenty of people I can see on TV that make millions on that. And I'm like, well, why don't you guys go after those donkeys? You know, I mean, <laughs> they're doing a lot more damage on the air saying that Jesus is going to save you right now if you give them $1,000 or as much money as you can. I'm being not a little bit sarcastic, but not completely here because you do see that stuff on TV a lot where you've got the wolves in sheep's clothing and the stuff that you've gone through just to make people aware of what you feel is a possible cataclysmic event. You know, I mean, that's you're putting yourself on the line and. I know people that have ostracized themselves from their family because of what they believe in, whether it's Planet X or something similar to Fringe like that, you know, when Fukushima has so many attacks from people that they care about because of what they're doing. And it's like, you know, they're doing it because they believe in it, yet they're getting attacked. And it kind of reminds me of some of those superhero comic books where the, you know, they have to go, the, the good guys, the ones that go through all the crap and the bad guys, the ones that have the nice house, the nice cars, all the money, etc. It's like, well, why do you want to be a good guy when you can be the villain and, and get all this stuff? Exactly. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a glamorous, uh, I call, I'll call it a job because right now that's what, I mean, I've retired from, um, the advertising and marketing industry, you know, 22 years and I've traveled around the world and I know people all over the world. And um, this is, I guess this is where I'm getting my passion. Uh, I feel that that we as a people, the inhabitants of this planet, I think we deserve more. I mean, don't you? I mean, I don't want to get caught with my pants down in, in the event of something this serious. So yeah, you know, I'll take the punches in the throat. You know, I'll take the knives in the back because that is pretty much what it's been two months after my channel started. Um, I started stumbling onto some very good, credible information, and my whole theory was, okay, I need to have as many eyes in the sky as I possibly can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the people that subscribe to my channel and in my videos to please go out there and let's photograph the sun. Let's photograph the sky in the day, in the night, in the afternoon. I want to photograph it from around the world because eventually someone's going to start capturing something. So, you know, it's like all of the observatories all over the globe. Okay, eventually they all have their telescopes fired up and they're looking into different areas of space. Well, the same applies for us little people. We can get our eyes in the skies and we could start to uncover what might possibly be there. And it's worked. It's worked in a fantastic way. And the subscribers to my channel are, are some of the best people walking this earth. These people are absolutely beautiful. And then they've come to protect me. 
if you know I was putting up four or five six videos a day because I had so much information coming in and there would come a day where okay I would take a little break or I had a function to go to and I didn't put a video up I would literally get a thousand emails Scott are you okay is everything okay you didn't you didn't upload a video we're worried about you and then you know you know we love you we, we respect you we're right behind you and that's what I wanted I wanted people to, to, to make a stand I don't I don't want to see everyone stick their head between their legs and just take it because we don't have to you know your ancestors and mine and everybody else's we built this planet we built it we live on it it's our baby it's not a government baby it's not a government planet it belongs to us and you know that's my whole that's my whole theory you know okay we built this planet we inhabit it okay you know human beings aren't perfect but we all we all don't deserve to have the sheets pulled over our eyes all of our money taken for the elite to run and hide in their golden bunkers and then come outside a few months later when things may be all clear and then try to start their whole new world order. Well, it's not going to happen on my watch, brother. It's just not going to happen. And uh, I've done a lot of organizing over the past nine months and I've done a, done a lot of networking over the past year. And the information that has come into my channel, which is every single day, is absolutely amazing. Now, I have to sift through it. And yes, we have the dreaded lens flare because the debunkers love that. I think that's the only word that they have in their vocabulary is lens flare. But I have team members that literally help me out with different avenues um, dealing with this subject. And as we were speaking, I have a friend of mine, he's a photographer, 25 years, owns his own studio, very professional, top-notch equipment. I had him start looking, you know, look at photographs for me. And, uh, you know, he taught me a lot uh, about uh, what to look for in these photographs. But then when I started showing him photographs that were off the wall, he started to say to me, hey, where are you getting these photographs? And I said, oh, you know, don't worry about it, but just tell me what is that in, in, in the photograph? He says, well, that's a that's a solid object. That's a, that's something, a planet, something near the sun. You know, and as I started documenting things all through this past summer, June, July, August, September, uh, you know, he made a believer out of himself just by looking at the footage and the and the um, the photographs and video. And then I had some people, subscribers who are ex-military, they're retired, um, they know a lot. They've actually come on board with me. And it's fantastic. I, I have some people in North Carolina. I've got some in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, and uh, out on the West Coast in California. And that does not even include all of the people that I have in European countries, South America, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, even Eastern Europe. Now, there are a bunch of countries that I don't hear from because they're very highly censored. I've only heard from a few people in Russia, um, a few people, you know, in Japan. But um, as far as all of Europe, well, they pretty much keep in contact with me on a daily basis. What uh, part of Europe, sorry to interrupt, Scott, what part of Europe would you say is the most popular for images that you're getting? Uh, Germany was very popular, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, uh, the northern tier of Italy. Um, now, Switzerland, all of a sudden, all the contacts that I had there, they can't see my YouTube channel anymore. Same thing with Belgium, Denmark, Germany's very rough now. Holland, a matter of fact, I just got an email 4.30 this morning from one of my uh, Dutch uh, associates over there, and uh, we test things on YouTube. Uh, they're not getting notifications for my newly uploaded videos, and they literally have to use a bookmark to go back to the YouTube channel. Well, you also were saying that you've got some pretty good connections as far as credible data, and you put together this folder for us that you're going to share, and I, I can't wait to see what you got, man. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I've been working very closely. Me and Steve Olson, we, we talk several times a day. I like um, Steve. We should, yeah, Steve's a good guy. We we started to collaborate on uh, some things in the middle of the summer, and he was very busy. I was very busy. 
uh, we just exchanged some emails and I had so many overloaded photographs and he was touching on some things that I was investigating and uh, Jeff P and Chris Potter and it had to do with the sun simulator this this whole fake sun theory and all of a sudden I had a German subscriber who is an old-time photographer she still uses the older 35 millimeter camera with film like real 35 millimeter film <laughs> and uh, a very massive telescopic lens on this camera and she develops her own uh, film and here's the thing and me and Steve finally came to a conclusion on this whenever you're looking at photographs taken in a digital form and then photographs on film when you zoom into them they don't pixelize the 35 millimeter film and you know some of the photographs that she was getting me um, they were absolutely fantastic and this had to do with the friends the Fresnel lens I believe when Steve was on with you the last time he was explaining it to you well I came up with the first photograph of it and it's almost like an x-ray photograph a special way that this lady takes photographs and develops them this Fresnel lens came out of the sky and I looked at it, I did a video about it, and it just so happens um, a, uh, a subscriber from Sweden who has an interest in lighthouses knew what this lens was, what it was called, what it was used for, and they were used for, oh my God, you're, you're talking very old technology going back to, whew, I think, late 1800s, 1900s, the Fresnel lens. Uh, it was used in tail lights of cars in the 50s and 60s, uh, but they use it as a reflecting glass lens for the lighthouse. So he gave me all the information. I did the background, and don't you know, that lens matched up with my picture. And then we started getting more photographs from people showing this anomaly and this lens in their photographs. Well, whenever I took this to my photographer friend, he's like, nah, that cannot be uh, something within the camera. He said, that's actually a reflected object in that photograph. And then when we started putting it all together and we were viewing those FAA weather cams up in Alaska, um, we were actually seeing that anomaly, that figure in these photographs. And then uh, between all of us, we put it together but discovering that Fresnel lens was the key factor because we could have just went on and on and on with theories and one of the theories that we had there's a few things that are going on as far as a sun simulator a sun simulator is definitely a possibility but if you've noticed the sun doesn't look the same anymore especially this year it has so many different shapes it can go from round to square, to rectangular, to a diamond shape, to a teardrop shape. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, the sun always looked the same. It was orange, not white, and it never reflected blue rays. And it never produced rainbow colored rays. And the further we looked into it, uh, you know, we started to understand that, oh, Something's not right up there. So this Fresnel lens or Fresnel lens, if you actually made one, a massive one, you could actually cut it like a pizza and reassemble it in space. And it would not be hard to place this object with eight different lenses on it that rotate depending on the period of day and the intensity of the sun. We've actually caught this thing rotating, and we've actually caught the lenses rotating. So they are actually able to turn this device up and down. I personally think the, uh, the astronauts that are in the uh, International Space Station, they always seem to have it in their photographs, right off in the distance. I think they control it, because where would be a better place to control something like that but out in space right next to it? It's in between the sun and the earth. And again, we've gone over and over this. Why? Well, if they're able to turn the intensity of this device up, then they are very easily blocking what we may have possibly seen 
from Earth in broad daylight. Forget about nighttime, because you'll probably just look up in the sky and think that's a star. But in the daytime, you would actually see some of these planets as they orbited and they got close to Earth, because they're not the size of Earth. They're larger, much larger. And when we uncovered this and we started looking a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper, they turned the heat up on both of us, both me, Steve, you know, and Chris Potter. Uh, Chris Potter has since disappeared. Me and Steve are still plugging away and being attacked like like savages every single day uh, for what we've uncovered. But, yeah, I'll definitely show you some of these photographs. I, I had a lady, oh, I think about two weeks ago who literally looked up into the sky as she was passing under an underpass on highway in Southern California and saw this object in the sky. She literally pulled her car over, got out, and took a photograph of it near the sun so she could see it with her bare eye. And uh, this, this device does have the ability to really turn the heat up. Uh, this, this, this device can just literally sear your skin. And I don't know if you've noticed this past summer, the intensity of the sun just going out there for a few minutes in direct sunlight literally just burns your skin so it's not like you're out in death valley i'm here in southwestern pennsylvania well let me jump in real quick to that note because i actually in 2013 picked up a military grade geiger counter it's built into my watch actually it's an mtm special ops rad watch and this thing i've taken around the country with me also i've taken it in the air when i flew to alaska and the levels have increased since 2013, about 50%. They're not extremely high, but they're still, okay, when I picked this thing up, they would hover around 0 0.07 microsieverts per hour in the San Antonio area. Now I very rarely see it below 0 0.10, and a lot of times it's at 0 0.12, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. When I flew to Alaska, levels went up over 60 times. They went up to 4.2, which was Ooh. just insanity. And that was that's pretty high, actually. That was really high. But uh, I do wonder, because I do notice the difference when the sun hits the skin. You can definitely feel the difference. I can see the difference in the sun. I can see the difference in the atmosphere. It is, the skies aren't as blue as they used to be. They used to be a deep blue. Now they're like this weird metallic blue. The sun, exactly. like you say, is white. You can feel it on the skin, even when the temperature is the same. Now, I don't know if it's because the atmosphere itself or the magnetosphere is failing, so more radiation is coming in. It could be a number of things, but there definitely is things that I can personally see, and a lot of people here at the League Project have noticed that as well. So, Oh, most definitely. There's, there's, uh, there's absolutely no doubt. Um, I mean, we've been keeping track of it every single day. Um, you know, going into this chemtrailing, between the sun simulation and the chemtrailing, well, this is their way to hide it. Now, the chemtrailing also has another added benefit. Um, it is blocking out, you know, some of that radiation, some of that intensity, because they, they just don't chemtrail the sky. They crisscross in front of the sun, right directly in front of the sun. Now, here in southwestern Pennsylvania, huh, you can count on it like clockwork, buddy. They are out there bursting in the morning. They will crisscross the sun and lightly. And then later on, oh, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, they'll do it again. And, you know, I got into chemtrailing with, um, you know, all the subscribers and they're doing it all over the world. I, I got uh, I got emails from people in Norway and Sweden that claim they, they hardly see the sun at all in their summertime and springtime. People in Germany, the UK, Scotland, Ireland. The only people I have not heard from is France. I haven't heard from one person. Hey, uh, we've talked to... Man, a gentleman that lives up in the Pyrenees, actually, Dave Dobbs. Oh, yeah, his YouTube Dave, channel. Yeah. yeah, and he's out there, and he talks about Planet X, Nibiru, and I think he does see chemtrails out there as well. It seems like it's a worldwide phenomenon. I believe it is. Um, I believe that these world governments, you know, you might as well say the UN, I believe that they've all been collaborating for a long time dealing with this subject because... This is going to be a worldwide matter. So, you know, I mean, let's face it. They don't want um, they don't work. They don't want the whole entire world in upheaval, because like I always say, we outnumber them. We outnumber all of the militaries. So in a dead heat fight, if it was us against them, well, even with their technology, we would give them one hell of a fight. They would not be able to control us. 
And I think that's what it boils down to is to have just total control over the earth during this event. And uh, I kind of agree with they are definitely looking at a depopulization because the less people that you have to control, the easier their job. So, you know, a lot of these things just fall into place. It's not make believe. You know, the government in the United States is not spending trillions of dollars over the past 30 years to build underground palaces under the Denver airport. They're not building seed vaults in, what is that, Sweden, I think, or Sweden or Norway, where they have that big seed vault in the dead Arctic region. Why? Well, possibly whenever the Earth does a tilt or a rotation, that seed vault will be in a nice climate. <laughs> right. You know? And you so know, I got to. They're doing, doing things strategically. Real, sorry, Scott. Let me just jump in real quick before I forget. This image right here that you're looking at is actually from one of our subscribers that saw that interview that I did with Steve on the sun anomaly or the, I guess, simulated sun. And he sent me this image right here. And if you look at this weird. That's it, buddy. That looks like it. I mean, it definitely is similar there. So sorry to interrupt. That's okay. I'll tell you what. I'll. Uh... I'll share a few um, photographs with you of this real quick, and uh, this will definitely this will definitely blow your mind here. Let me uh, let me get into this and yeah, that uh, it's called Slivdard Global Seed Vault, and that's out there on an island outside of Norway in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. Do <laughs> um, you see my screen now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well here you go. Here's a here's a close up right there. Now there, you could see this. You could see a rim around it. Now, it's kind of faded in the middle a little bit. That looks identical. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm going to get, get to the, uh, the one photograph. Oh, I should have uh, put these all together in, uh, you know, an order. But uh, look at that. Now, that's the photograph that the lady literally pulled over on, I think, the I-5 in Southern California and saw that with her naked eye. Now that's been blown up and cropped by me, but no color changes, no contrast. That is what she saw. And if you look at a Fresnel lens, they're very easy to make. And with today's technology, they could make them as big as they want. If you had to transport it, you slice it like a pizza and you put it back together like a pizza it will still do the same job because see this doesn't have to be like a contact lens where you couldn't have uh, slices and put it back together because it would distort everything with a lens like this you want to distort light that's what you're trying to do you're trying to broaden the light that's coming through the back side of it now i'm sure there are many more mechanics uh to this object but Here's another photograph that there's the sun up to the left. You can see the lens. Now, it's my thought that there are approximately eight lenses. Eight is very easy, very divisible by a 24 hour period. So therefore, I believe they have different thicknesses and they're able to turn that intensity up. And the light is coming from the sun. They're just filtering it through this device. But that's just my theory. Uh, there's a lot of other people that have the same theory, and we've been working to uncover it, and slowly but surely, it's getting to the point where, how can you say that doesn't exist? Because I literally have people all over the world that are sending me these photographs in. So what are you telling me? You're telling me that every one of my subscribers, uh, Steve Olson's subscribers, they're all idiots, and they have broken 10-cent cameras. Well... I have to say you're wrong. Now, that, that is one in cloud cover. So it's not a lens flare. Cloud cover wouldn't cover a lens flare. I mean, if you, if you look at that, <laughs> you start to say, okay, what is it? Now, if I would have never received that email from uh, my guy who likes lighthouses and has studied them for like 35 years, I would have never known about a Fresnel lens. Did you ever hear about it before? No. Well, actually, the technology, though, is similar to, didn't they use that type of technology also in a lot of satellites that go into space? 
Yeah, I've never heard about it in the in the satellites. I just heard about it with the lighthouse, uh, the lighthouse lenses, and then flashlights back in the 50s, uh, uh, tail lights in the 50s. Um, I mean, they still use this Fresnel lens technology even to this day. But you know, if you're kind of not in that field of science or technology, you really wouldn't know about it. So I think they used some very old technology with new technology, and uh, they made themselves a a sun simulator, or, you know, I wish I actually knew 100% what is the reason why it is there. You know, and we're just going by what we feel and from what we're, uh, the feedback that we're getting from people all over the world, especially me. You know, I mean, I literally talk to these people. I talk to them on the phone. I have Google Hangouts with them where we can share photographs. So I've actually stepped it up. I just don't blow out YouTube videos. I actually get out there and I talk to to these people, literally talk to them. Now, that's the blowout photograph right there that uh, that lady sent me in. That is done with regular 35 millimeter film. And um, that's pretty hard to, not, to deny right there. That's not some type of photographic anomaly. That's an actual structure. Looks like a seashell in space. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, what does Chris Potter say? The flying cheese sandwich? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's a piece of pepperoni right there in the center, too. Exactly. So whenever you look at this, I mean, what are you supposed to say to yourself? You know, oh, you know, I've been told all kind of things by these debunkers, the, the whatever they want to call themselves, naysayers. And when I took this to my guy, again, more than 25 years owning his own uh, photography studio, he's like, what is that? And I said, well, that's why I'm coming to you. You tell me, what is that? He says, I know that photograph was taken with regular 35 millimeter film, but what is it? And I said, it was, it was a photograph taking into the sky, the nighttime sky, using a massive telescopic lens. And he says, well, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely a solid object because it has shading on it, meaning light is hitting it from one angle. You can clearly see that by the center point right here. There's a little bit of shading. That's all you need right there to show the light source where it's being hit. And uh, this lady also uncovered uh, some other uh, fantastic photographs for me that were absolutely amazing. And then you come to this. I mean, there's your sun up here. And there's your big Fresnel lens. And doesn't it look like some types of structure around it? I so, can't really uh, tell with that one exactly. That's... And you can see the same shape. There's the, the, little, the little layered shapes. It does blow my mind. And, you know, I go back to these photographs and, you know, the same thing with Steve. You know, we this has literally caused us loss of sleep is trying to figure this out. I mean, I know a lot of our attention should have been on other things, but we really, really feel that, you know, they are literally trying to deceive us with this sun simulation. But, um, you so know, what do you hey, think listen, the point we, is? We may, we may be wrong. Like, you know, wh we, what do you feel they're doing it for, Scott? Well, I, I think I think I think the number one cause is there has been so much interaction with our sun. Um, with I, I think a few of these planets are close to our sun. I believe they are interacting with our sun. Now, Chris Potter did some pretty good uh, background information with a physicist. Um, it seemed like the sun was going dim for about one hour a day, losing internal pressure. The sun has been so erratic throughout 2016. And that's that's documented. I mean, that's documented by by NASA and space weather reporting. I mean, we've had massive CMEs. I mean, if you watch the sun every day on you know the Helio Viewer or Sechi or you know whatever you're going to use to watch it, I mean, it's been absolutely amazing. But in the same aspect, you know, our sun, the energy I feel is being drawn away from the sun. And you know, look at the earthquakes going on across the globe. I keep track of earthquakes on a minute to minute basis. I have programming in my computer. I watch a few reputable um, earthquake channels on YouTube. We've had over 42,000 earthquakes this year alone. Now, that's a lot. I've discussed this with Gil Broussard in depth. And we've both come to the conclusion that yes, you know, the earth is being heated up internally our tectonic plates are being pulled on. 
we have a lot of things going on with the sun. And listen, we're not, we, we don't have all of the top-notch information either. Okay, we don't have the inside information where we would know exactly what's happening. And I think that they've uh, constructed this device, and I, I think it proves, uh, you know, by looking at some of the photographs of the sun, they're doing something with the sun. They're using it to either, you know, cloak these objects by turning the intensity up, or the possibility is that, you know, one or two or all of these planets that are out there have affected the sun so intensely that uh, it doesn't have the ability to actually heat the Earth. And that would be very scary. That would be very scary. Now, I think the sun, if anything like that would have happened, you know, I mean, I think the sun would be able to repair itself. But, um, you know, again, just a hypothesis. Uh, it's a very scary situation, you know. And, it, you know, I guess it's, it's, it makes me stay up at night. When um, I went to Big Bend area and also Fort Davis, where there's a really nice observatory out there, that's a world-class observatory. It's about 6,000, about 5,500 feet, I think, is the elevation of it. And I had a chance to talk to uh, somebody in customer relations out there about the sun and the solar activity, etc. And according to him, the sun has been very mellow. And when... You go, aren't there certain websites you can go to that will actually show you the sun with certain telescopes and filters and imagery? Oh, yeah. I mean, you could go to any of the NASA sites, uh, you know, the SETI or, or any of them, and um, they will – I mean, you could go right there. You could look at the sun, um, you know, in, in pretty much live time. Uh, you can watch sus uh, Suspicious Observers on YouTube. gives a very in-depth um, – analysis of the sun on a daily basis and uh yes they'll, they'll they'll say oh you know the sun's at you know one of its low tick periods blah 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 but um i kind of beg to differ i watch uh the lasco and the soho i have a gentleman that watches it for me all day he's retired military very very smart gentleman and um he monitors it for me on a daily basis and there have been several periods throughout the uh, the summer that, you know, we could have had CME warnings, and we have. And then Obama opens up his, uh, what is it, Space Disaster Department in Washington, D.C. When have we ever had one of those? Was that with, uh, included with the bill that recently passed, space, we space weather events? You got it. They actually have their own office. In Washington DC staffed with people and this is what they're doing so it's kind of like subliminal you know they put out these movies you know like big motion pictures uh, the, the day after tomorrow 2012 it's kind of they want to see what people would do in the event of a cataclysmic event like that and the same thing goes with uh, you know near Earth uh, objects, asteroids, meteors. Well, lo and behold, going into September, we have an asteroid coming at the Earth almost a mile long. Nobody knows anything about it. But I found out about it. I found out about it through a friend of mine who is a liaison in Kuwait. And these governments scrambled. He had firsthand information on it. And uh, they started scrambling in March 2016, United States, China, Russia, and uh, several of the uh, Middle Eastern governments. And they literally met in Kuwait, face to face. What are we going to do? And it, it was given to the United States. You have the heaviest rockets. You can carry the heaviest payload. We have to get up there and we have to try to destroy this asteroid. And uh, the first observation craft went up. I believe it got um, some coordinates, photographs. By the time those photographs get back to the Earth, I think it was about a two and a half week period before the information gets back to NASA. By then, they already had rocket a rocket on, on the pad at Cape Canaveral with uh, a nuclear warhead in it. And, you know, when I received this information from a very good friend of mine from college, we're like brothers. You know, he said to me, he's like, Scott, he goes, this, this, this could be the big one, man. He goes, I know what you're doing with your YouTube channel, but, 
is there any way that you can get the word out on this because this is going to be bad if they fail this is going to be really bad I didn't have much information on it but I went with it and uh, all of a sudden June July and August rocket after rocket after rocket from the United States government now they claim that they're going up to meet an asteroid to take dirt samples and bring back the dirt samples of the asteroid okay well Rex I don't know about your tax bracket but I don't think they have the right to spend a trillion dollars on rockets going out into space to pick up a dirt sample from an asteroid we already have those samples here on earth they're already in NASA laboratories so why are you gonna beat my ear with that kind of crap and the systematic way that these rockets went up June July August and then in September Russia had one rocket sitting on the pad as a backup in Russia and September 8th it was scrapped because they did their job by September 25th and 26th we already had meteorites pounding the earth burning up in the atmosphere all over the world now I was ripped to hell about my prediction and I was less than 24 hours off when the first meteor would break the atmosphere and I got a beaten let me tell you <laughs> I mean I took a beating the fear-mongering blah 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 you know and then I started getting photographs in from all over the world of these meteors breaking through the Earth's atmosphere here's one of them here I showed this photograph to one of my debunkers he said it was a contrail I said oh really well if you look on the fireball sightings website this was seen from Texas to Southern California and photographed by a lot of people here's another one different different area and these all that's just contrails man that's a plane just <laughs> left an airport that's a little Cessna <clears throat> yeah this uh, this kept going on and on and on and I had one gentleman that was monitoring the meteor scan website well we were getting barraged by huge lines of meteors coming from everywhere but thank God they were burning up in the atmosphere but the debunkers say oh bloody hell we get that all the time okay yeah just like we have earthquakes all the time just like we have tornadoes and and hurricanes and blah 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 but everything fell in line with what the governments did with that asteroid now all of a sudden we have a massive asteroid in orbit around the earth and I've got photographs of it the International Space Station has had it out in front of it since the end of September and they follow it around the earth and I'm not the only one who has seen it it is stuck in Earth's orbit and if that thing falls to Earth we can kiss all of our rear ends goodbye you said it's a yeah. mile long uh, it's probably more than a mile long and that's the it's, one we're looking at right now no this one let me find it for you I have a photograph uh, I'm pretty sure I stuck it in this file because I you know they shut this live feed down uh, real quick right after that uh, right after the asteroid explosion started getting these photographs in from the International Space Station so I mean you know we've all seen photographs of the earth when have you ever seen the earth with a huge pink canopy of cloud cover over it there's the space station there's this huge pink cloud cover and then at the end of September through all of October subscribers from all over the world are saying why why is my sky orange at night not at six and seven o'clock at 10 11 midnight one two three o'clock in the morning Philadelphia got photographs from Philly from people in all these neighborhoods their skies were burnt orange in the middle of the night how's that possible they were covered by a big lens flare that's why <laughs> lens flares are getting wicked <laughs> they are they most definitely are um, I got this photograph myself one day and uh, this might not look like too much on your screen but uh, this was taken from a, a, a web camera 
and uh, it clearly looks like a metallic object back in the sky. I started thinking, oh, maybe that's condensation on the inside of the lens. And then I started looking at the other photographs that came in sequence, and um, I don't know. Looks metallic to me. And uh, it was changing shapes. You know, and, and again, I'm not the only one who saw this in the sky through these webcams. Uh, they were actually seen on 36 other webcams across the world. What is it? I don't know. I wish I knew. But uh, this asteroid, let me find the photograph of this thing because it is, uh, well, this is, this is, a, this is a, a rock that one of my subscribers was able to take with uh, a high-powered telescope. And uh, as far as the actual size of it, it's, uh, it, was, it was like out by the moon. And they literally were able to capture a photograph of it during a full moon. And um, that's a pretty, pretty sizable rock. And I believe that we are under threat. Um, if you listen to other Nibiru researchers, Planet X researchers, they talk about the, uh, the large tail of debris. Well, you know, I mean, these objects have to come through the Kuiper belt, the asteroid belt. And they're going to be knocking rocks into our inner solar system, you know, like a billiard table. So if you, you know, mess around with uh, probability, all you know, the laws of probability start to kick in. So sooner or later, we're going to be in the path of something. Now, I checked as of today, November 20th, we've had over 15,000 near-Earth objects documented with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The closest one that just came, came zigging by us between the Earth and the Moon was uh, 27,000 miles away. Is that close enough for you? It was closer to the Earth than it was to the moon. You remember Star Wars program back in the 80s, and they were talking about putting some type of defense system up in space, and then it went really hush-hush for a long time, and then they said they Ab just decided not to do anything with it? Absolutely. I wonder sometimes if maybe there is something in place out there to help prevent Earth, you know, something hitting the Earth, essentially, like whether it's uh, space weapons, missiles, I don't know. There's, there's probably something out there that kind of offsets certain meteorites and asteroids and possible doom scenarios i mean i would hope so I, i've seen i've seen several nasa simulations on uh craft and devices that they would like to get up there they may possibly already have them up there um you know using gravity uh to move these objects um explosions uh you know to force them off of their trajectory um you know, but again, you know, me and you, we're not privy to that, that tax dollar information. And I'm sure that this has probably been, you know, somewhere on their top level because they had to have researched a lot of what I'm researching, but 20 years ago. So, you know, they imaged, they imaged this nemesis solar system or whatever you want to call it. They imaged it with IRAS. They have the photographs, they know the path, they know the orbit, they know 100%. And nobody's going to tell me that they don't. There is entirely too much evidence out there. And again, you could go all the way back to the ancient Chinese through all the biblical times right up to where we're at in 2016. The only thing that we don't have is the timeline. They have the timeline. They don't want to share it. They have their agenda, and it doesn't include us. This is a photograph from uh, my German lady over there in Germany, and this looks like an object that was actually impacted and part of it torn off. This is another part of that photograph. She, she took a quick few shots, and there you have it. Your battery is running low. <laughs> A lot of people that listen to Leak Project are looking for security blankets, essentially, in case of certain events, such as if there is a Planet X out there that could cause a pole shift or mass earthquakes, volcanoes, etc. There's different locations around the world that are considered by many to be safer than others in case of certain events. And a lot of people like the Ozarks because of the amount of food that is just bountiful out there that grows 
in the wild. Roots, different flowers and plants, etc. that could be used for medicinal purposes as well. Combined with just the location, the environment's pretty mellow year-round, and you still get four seasons. Well, at myozarkhomestead.com, Jeff has put together an opportunity for what I like to call blue-collar bunkers. Because these are affordable shelters that are built to specification on site, and there's also a bunker system that's being built out there that is supposed to be built to some incredible specifications. So talk to Jeff about it at myozarkhomestead.com if you're looking for an off-grid opportunity for long-term survival or if you just want some type of security blanket and you enjoy your 9-to-5 lifestyle, that's awesome. This is a good opportunity for many people to have in their portfolio. So myozarkhomestead.com. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Believe me, I stay up at night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I'll tell you, you've got just a ton of images. It's. I was looking at the background because you were sharing your screen and you had about 10 images up at once there. And this one here on the left, that hole in the planet thing, I've heard different different theories on this. Tell us about this one. The Death well, Star. Yeah, the Death Star. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, right now, we don't know what it is. Um, I've had some incredible video taken of this at the end of August going into September. It came out of Australia, New Zealand, and a guy in Texas. Very clear images, uh, video, zoomed in perfectly. You could see this object spinning so fast that it would look distorted. That's how fast it was spinning in the sky. And we were able to get some, you know, uh, images of it as, um, well, I don't want to say slowed down, but it, it would it would actually stop and then continue to spin. Now, this photograph, we took all of the color out of it. Uh, we took all of the contrast just to try to see what it was. And again, you know, I mean, I wish I had a solid answer to say what that is. But it's nothing that me and you saw in the sky as a kid. Because if that was in the sky 20 years ago, maybe it might be in the current history books for kids in school. But nobody's talking. Nobody's saying anything. Now, this is a back image of it. And you can see that hole is not there. Now, I did a video about, I called it the planet with a hole in it. Well, the debunkers came out. And they're like, Scott's crazy. He's a lunatic. That is nothing but an out-of-focus star. Well, I'll tell you this much, Rex. I know what a photographed star looks like. And that's not a star. That is a massively solid object that is rotating so fast in like this very erratic pattern. So once again, how can hundreds, if not thousands, of people all over the globe take the same broke down video footage of that object how's that possible you know how it's possible because everybody's using a 10 cent camera and their cameras are broken they're all broke they're all junk you know so <laughs> cosmic cubert man remember cubert busted <laughs> did, did you ever see that game cubert Oh, of course. That's Cubert right there, out there in space. <laughs> well, that's what we're gonna. That's gonna. We're gonna rename it. But you know what? The younger generation wouldn't even know what the hell Cubert was. <laughs> <laughs> they'd, they'd have to YouTube it. Oh, that's what Cubert is. Exactly. Exactly. But we do. We get. We get massive amounts of photographic information. And again, when you insult my videos and you insult my channel, you insult every single one of my subscribers and that's why these people will rip your heart out when you attack me because you're attacking them same thing goes for steve olson you know i mean we do our best to gather the information screen it look at it scrutinize it and then try to figure it out so why are you kicking me in the balls why because i'm uncovering things Every hour of the day and the weeks and the months 
that there are certain people out there that do not want everyone in the world to get on a frenzy and know about it. You know what? I spent 22 years in international marketing and advertising all over the world. I was an advertising executive. If I wanted to have 10 million subscribers on YouTube, they wouldn't let me. They're filtering my YouTube channel. They're doing the same thing to Steve. They're doing the same thing to all of the other uh, uh, conspiracy theory YouTube channels. As of October 1st, my views, I would put up a video. I would get 1,000 to 1,500 views an hour constantly. I have videos out there that have, you know, eight, 900,000, a million views, 500, 600,000 views. And all of a sudden, October 1st, that all went to hell. Now I'm being censored all over the world, and my subscribers have proved it. I don't need technology to prove it. My subscribers proved it. And then, two weeks ago, I discovered all of my channel settings were mysteriously set back to default. So my YouTube channel was set in the category of automotive. How is that possible? All my tags, meta tags, they were all erased. I talked to Steve Olson. Same thing with him. Looked at his YouTube channel. All of his tags weren't erased, but all of the commas between every word were erased, and it was one big long word. So anybody who has anything to do with this subject, they're coming at you in a little, you know, behind the scenes. Okay, we'll just limit the amount of people that he can get to. But my my subscriber level keeps going up, but the views. They just stay kind of low now. I would have 40, 50,000 views in less than 24 hours. So, you know, YouTube's playing around there. They're probably being, you know, sent some messages. Hey, stop this guy. Stop this guy. Stop this guy. Stop this guy. They're getting too close. There's a lot going on with the internet and as easy as it is to send images and information around the world and reach thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people in a short amount of time. It's also, there's these safeguards out there, algorithms, supercomputers, software programs, backdoors within backdoors within backdoors and stuff that I probably don't even fathom that can stop and divert certain information packets. So it's good to be on stuff like this. And as soon as you can, if this information gets out there, pick it up as quick as possible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if not, it's going to be scrubbed. It's going to be censored. And this is happening. This is happening all over, you know, um, I had a 16 year old kid that was, you know, uh, a subscriber on my channel and um, he, he wanted to jump in the Google Hangouts that I hold with my team members all over where we could talk face to face, chat, exchange pictures, screens, just like we're doing now. And we're, we're on with each other at least twice a day. And um, he wanted to join us. Very smart kid. OK, graduated high school already. That's how smart he is. And he showed me if I go onto my YouTube channel and I right click and open up the HTML coding behind my YouTube channel. I might be able to see if they're filtering me. Well, I did just that while we were on the Google Hangout. And lo and behold, there is a whole stack of two letter country codes for every country in the world. And there's a whole box of them on my YouTube channel and on Steve Olson's channel. So we just said, okay, well, you know what? Let's go test another YouTube channel, see if they have the same setting. So we um, we clicked on, uh, what's that Colbert, that Colbert guy? the uh, John Colbert, is that his name? I forget his first name. The comedian? Yeah. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, so we went on his YouTube channel. We right-click, inspected his HTML. Nothing. Nothing. You could see his information anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter. You could be in a communist country. You could watch his YouTube channel. So we already know what they're doing. It's plain and simple. Listen, I, I like I said, I spent 22 years in big time advertising. I know all about numbers. I, I know all about views. I dealt with cable TV advertising, the whole nine yards, man. I know what it means to get a response. And I knew it was going to happen October 1st. It didn't take long. It took three days. As soon as that Internet problem went away over to the U.N., that's it. Well, you're talking about ICANN, aren't you? Because I did yep. a bunch of research yep. into that. And although ICANN now is going to have basically 
control over the domains, and they're basically the clearinghouse of all domains. So they're even going to come out with a bunch of new domain names that you're going to pay $100 for this, $500 for this. I don't know what the exact amount is, but they're actually talking about doing personalized tags at the end of the dot whatever and getting really expensive so where corporations that have the money can purchase those things and people that – anyway – I'm kind of diverting here, but I don't think it has a whole lot to do with the UN specifically. Is the UN going to be involved? Yes, but there's also a lot of corporations and other big players involved. I would say it's more of a corporatocracy now that has access to the control of the Internet keys, not necessarily the United Nations. Yeah, I probably I, I would agree with you. You know, and these corporations, these corporations around the world, man, some of them are like governments. Oh, yeah. They, they've got more money than some governments. A lot more. Yeah, yeah they have some serious, serious power. You know, and um, I mean, this could be I mean, I'm sure there's 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 a reason out there. You know, I just haven't dug into it because I just I don't even have the time in the day. I need about five or six more hours added on to that 24, you know. But uh, here's another photograph of that. Um, what do we just call it? The Q-Bert? q -Bert. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, it's uh, these were these were captured by someone else with a with a, with a broken camera. Yeah, it's you the know. same one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same same. Um, one came from Texas, the other came from Australia. So these two guys got together and they collaborated, they exchanged cameras, and they took the uh, the photograph with uh, each other's broken camera. Now you can see there that that's a hole because it's turned sideways. So something collided with this object at uh, obviously very high speed impact and uh, tore a huge chunk out of it. It's still there. I wanted to show you this image. This is what NASA does. This was taken October 21st, 2016. Okay, this is the uh, the SOHO. You're looking at the sun. You see that big coronal discharge? Wow, look at that. Look up in the corner. You see that little thing right there? So yeah, you it's zoom like a in vortex. The, yeah, you zoom into that, and you can see the cut mark. Woo, that was a UFO. They cut it in half. They cut it in half. So they don't, they don't do their job. They're, NASA people are not good at editing. They <laughs> suck. They suck at it. Okay? And and you know what? These are supposed to be some they of the They do that just to give us a gem, man. They're like, we're just going to take half. So that the conspiracy <laughs> theorists will be like, look, it's a UFO. And then the other guy is going to be like, you guys are crazy. And they're just sitting back laughing. So this picture is, is goes back all the way to 2005. Okay? Now... I showed this photograph to my arch nemesis debunker, who I'll leave unnamed, and he says, oh, Scott, that's just ice. It's just ice. I said, what is it? I said, you know, your, your, your Brooklyn accent's really stiff, man. <laughs> but he said, oh, that's just ice. Wow. That's a large piece of ice with wings, some type of propulsion uh, exhaust coming out of the back of it. And for it to be that close to the sun and that hot, that must be some special kind of ice. And it flies around. Wow. What kind of ice do they have? Cosmic ice. Once again, back in 2013, I've been collecting these images. Once again, that's a craft. That's a craft. That's not ice floating through space that close to the sun. Once again, here's another image. Wow. Wow. That looks like some type of craft with propulsion exhaust from the rear. But then again, it could be a bird-shaped iceberg floating through space. That reminds uh, me of ice pirates. Now, let me ask you a question. <laughs> um, that What is the size of something like that? I mean, it's I'm trying to graph that out in my mind and compare there, it to the sun. You, How big is it? There you go. Graph that. <laughs> you see the round white circle? That's the size of the sun, correct? That's the size of the sun. The black circle is the filter over the over the sun, so you so you can actually use the camera on the craft on the Lasco. Well, there's your craft. Look at the size. Now, this craft I would probably say is closer to the camera than it is to the sun. Right. So it's going to look. You it's going to appear larger. Yeah, you can see that it is quite large, even though it's further away from the sun. You can see that that craft is very very large. Now, getting into this photograph, this will this will give you the the size. If you look at that photograph, you can see the the craft clearly where it's at near the sun. 
and there's the blown up version of it. Now, you can go on to the Soho and the Lasco uh, site, internet site, and if you have the time, you can sit there and you can go through the footage. You could actually make your own little movie on yesterday or the day or whatever archive date you want to put in because the images go up immediately. Now, as of lately, they've been scrubbing a lot of footage and they're not good at it. Years ago, they actually used to use a Sharpie magic marker and they would they would wipe things out and play around with the contrast. But now with technology, you know, they just try to cut it out or they mess around with the timestamp on the footage. Um, there's a lot of activity around the sun on a daily basis. Uh, craft of many, many different sizes and shapes. Um, some of them, you could even see them shooting, shooting things out of, uh, out of the crafts. You know, I don't know exactly what they are, <laughs> but you know, are they, uh, <laughs> are they from our earth? I don't think so. Well, they look similar to some of the ancient Sumerian Anunnaki tablets yes, and, you know, some of the yeah older stuff that you see that's thousands of years old. Yes, absolutely. And uh, how does that constantly appear around the sun year after year after year after year? I mean, is somebody out there making Anunnaki winged craft out of icebergs in a mold and sending them towards the sun? I mean, come on. Yeah, you know, that's how everybody does it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this photograph, you know, I mean, NASA hates the idea that this Lasco photograph was ever seen. And uh, you, you can't debunk this photograph. OK, that's not Mars. That's not Mercury. That's not Venus. That was a planet slipping underneath the sun. Now, the video footage of this, I don't even know if you could actually find the video footage of it anymore in the archives. But it happened, and people were watching, and they leaked the footage out. And if you look at the size of the sun compared to the size of that planet, well, that's a pretty large planet. And I'm going to show you some footage right now that's probably going to definitely blow your mind. Now, I want to just touch on one thing here real quick. This photograph here, look at, you have an unknown planet. That's not a star. Where my pointer is pointing at right now. That is not a star. It is also not a known planet because when we were viewing this footage, okay, we looked at every star chart, um, uh, every possible way to figure out what this was. And it's not Jupiter. It's not Mercury, Mars, or Venus. But that was a massive planet that moved past the sun and behind the sun and then came out of the other side 12 hours later. But look what's down in the corner. Look what's down in the corner. One of those crafts. Plain as day. And that's just uh, that photograph. I, I actually have it cropped. But uh, that photograph goes back to, I think, uh, mid-October. And uh, this footage here is going to blow your mind. This is from 2007. And uh, this footage was actually sent to me by someone who wanted to remain anonymous and they said that this was video footage of a rogue planet that entered our solar system looped around the sun in an orbit and back out in its orbit and when you watch this i gave this footage to the debunkers and they say it's the moon our moon so i can remember from my ninth grade earth space science class that our moon doesn't orbit the sun. Can you zoom in on that one? Oh, I'm going to let you see it. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Yeah, you can watch it. Now, that's our moon. The white circle is the sun. Now, watch the interaction. Watch how, like it says, watch it boomerang around the sun. Look at the reaction of the sun. Really? That's the moon? It made it around the sun in 55 hours and 20 minutes. 
Now it's going to rewind and go backwards just to show you. This is the footage that NASA doesn't want you to see. But they know that they know that the common man is not going to see this. Well, let me jump in real quick, Scott, because it looks like it just goes straight through. Yeah, it does look like that. It doesn't even look like it boomerangs. It's like it just. Hmm. Now, there's there's another. Let me just jump out of here. There's another version of this that was caught on the Soho. Now, this footage got me in all kind of trouble. This footage is what put the trolls and the debunkers on me like cancer. And then they told me that was the moon to our Earth. Now, this planet made it around the sun in seven days. It's going in reverse now, but just the footage is being reversed. Watch the interaction of the sun. See it? A little boom. Kind of like sparks. Exactly. Have you ever heard of the moon, our moon, orbiting the sun all by itself? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they teach you that in school, man. Yeah. So, you know, this is what I put up with as far as, okay, we're looking at some absolutely mind-blowing footage. And, and the best that you have is you're going to tell me that's the moon. Well, and let me jump in real quick, too, because mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm all for a reasonable explanation because a lot of times when you see something that looks just so incredible, oftentimes there is an explanation for it that's very simple. Yet, if you come to me with, oh, that's the moon, well, I mean, come on. Let's come up with something better than that, like you said, yeah. because that's just going to make somebody that has a brain that can think for themselves. And, hey, maybe I'm off, man. Maybe that is the moon. I mean, maybe, I mean, I don't know. I guess everything that I think is reality isn't because I wouldn't ever think the moon would do that. So, but let's just say it is. Wow. I, how did that go through the sun like that? And how do people see the moon almost every single night? So it just doesn't make any sense. So, but, I mean, could it possibly be some type of, anomaly in the camera equipment could somebody have gotten that behind the scenes like some hacker and been like oh let's do something really cool and make this look neat you know i mean are those possibilities um actually probably not because this footage stereo behind core 2 february 21st 2007 that footage now is back in the archives on lasco and if you wanted to pull it up right now and watch that video for yourself you can through NASA. Uh huh. See, that's another one of those oh boy moments. See, well, it would be nice. You know, think, they, oh, go ahead, Scott. They don't think they don't. They don't think people are going to go back and look at billions of pieces of footage and find that. But that person at that time was investigating something, and this woman who did this footage, she's disappeared. Me and Steve Olson have tried to find her. She has disappeared. Her YouTube channel's still up, but she disappeared. She hasn't posted anything else. She's gone. She posted both of those footages and much more, and she's gone. We can't find her. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. I mean, whatever that was, it certainly looked like some type of enormous orb you know i mean you can see it right there and i mean compared to the size of the sun which is the round circle and you have the timing right on the bottom of the screen you have stereo behind core two watch the interaction that it has with the sun you see that big flash yeah. at the bottom the big yeah. black flash you can see it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. it's a you know i mean it definitely interacted with the sun it orbited it made that sharp orbit around the sun in seven days and 18 hours. That is moving. My only theory is, if this is some type of planet, it's gotta have some type of 
cloaking device essentially or something out there and this is this sounds far out but they've even got mercedes benz cars prototypes that have this led set up around the entire car to where it mimics its background with cameras and sensors etc so when it's driving it just simulates the background to blend in well that would be a theory i guess with something like this because otherwise you'd have a lot more people picking up on stuff like this and this is what a lot of genuine debunkers and, and people that genuinely feel that Planet X isn't legit are going to say, they're going to be like, look, I've been an astronomer for 30 years, for 40 years. I've got a really nice setup. I've got friends that have nice telescopes. We're always looking for something, and we've never seen it. Exactly. And <laughs> there, there's a gentleman that doesn't live too far away from me. He lives down in the Laurel Highlands, the southern mountains, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. Very wealthy man. I don't know exactly what he did for a living before he retired, but he was an avid uh, amateur astronomer. He built a massive observatory in his yard, on his property, on a mountainside. Beautiful, beautiful house, beautiful piece of property. He actually retired and utilizes his observatory, uh, and he does astrophotography, and he frames it and sells it as art for his spare time. Well, this man's only 45 miles away from me. He has a massively high-tech, high-level equipment in that little observatory, which can rotate 360 degrees. It's in a dome. It's just, just like what you see on TV, but on a smaller scale. And I, I approached him, and I asked him point blank, will you help me? And, uh, you know, he said, listen, I'm retired. I have two kids in college. I can't afford to do this. And he knew I could see the look on his face. Because remember, I spent 22 years of my life listening to people lie to me in boardrooms, in big meetings, and we're talking big contracts. And advertisements. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I faced some of the best in corporations in this world. And um, one of my professors was actually a retired FBI agent who was a profiler, and he taught body language. I took an extensive course in it. So I'm kind of one of those types of people that uh, you really can't lie to me. I'll read right through you. And, and you know, whenever I spoke with him, I could see that he was super nervous, and um, he just didn't want anything to do with it. So, you know, the astronomers will say, well, we can't see anything. Well, here's the problem with astronomy. Okay, you're looking through a telescope. Anybody, I have a telescope. One of my subscribers took their telescope, boxed it up, and mailed it to me, gave it to me. But when you're looking through a telescope, you're only looking through a small portion of space. So if you don't know where to point the telescope, then you're just looking out into the universe. So if astronomers don't know where to look, going to be looking at things that they know are there constellations stars planets and you know if, if, if you're not looking you know every single minute of the day with a massive observatory style telescope you probably won't find it you probably won't see it now you know they all say oh you can't see the brown dwarf star because it has to be seen in infrared well I'm not too up on the theory of this brown dwarf star, but if a brown dwarf star was close to the sun, the sun would illuminate it. It would shine like a halogen headlight. I've asked that question. I've gotten the professional answer. Yes, it would illuminate, just like the planets illuminate when the sun is basically powering them up to light them up in the nighttime sky. So, if we had an object coming at us and it was illuminated, then it would be very easy to see if you looked in the right place. And right now, all of my subscribers and probably by now, millions of people around this world are looking in the southwest region of the sky. Why? Because towards the end of August, going into September, people in the northern hemisphere, specifically Alaska and the northern tiers of Canada started seeing what they thought was a star in the southwest region of the sky 
and off to the distance to the right, right above the horizon, was Venus. So you can't mistake it for Venus because Venus is right above the horizon. This object is way, way higher in the sky and just as bright. Well, guess what? I put a video out there a few days ago at the beginning of the week because I stumbled onto some footage from a few ladies in Alberta, Canada who have been documenting this object in a journal and with photographs and video. And these are smart ladies and they've been documenting it and they've been watching it coming in in that same spot. And it comes up at about 6.45 p.m. and it's visible for about three hours. So I want to go ahead and I want to, well, what you're looking at right here, these are just current photographs of what I'm talking about. So you can see the date right there at the bottom, November 1st. Okay. I mean, it's, these photographs are now coming in from all over the world. So let me jump in real quick then. You could act, if somebody that said, hey, this is great. Now I've got an idea and they had a telescope. They wanted to get outside, take a look at something like that. They can contact you and you can say, hey, this is this is the area. This is where you want to point your telescope. And can you yep. tell us that now? Like, I know you said the Southwest, but can you be a little more specific with us? Yeah, this is the uh, this is the object. Let me get a clearer photograph for you, because we got we got 245 images of this object on the 18th of November. And one of our um, one of our uh, subscribers who happens to have a much larger telescope with photographic and video quality uh, equipment on it. Um, we're looking, so so say for instance, you're standing, see again, where you live on this earth plays a little bit of a part in it too. Because you could be standing in Australia and I could be standing in Nevada, we're not looking at the same part of the sky. But anyways, um, this photograph, uh, the gentleman's name is Paul. He's been doing some fantastic work for us. This photograph, I know it's a little bit blurry, but if you take a look at this photograph, you can clearly see craters all through this planet. And this is what is coming in. And people, you now we, we modified this a little bit to enhance it uh, in the contrast. But if you take a look at this, this is what is coming in. So all everybody in the United States is looking as soon as the sun set by, you go out and you look into the direction where you see Venus. Now you could use the Sky Map app on your cell phone. Download it. It's very easy to use. You can point your cell phone anywhere in the sky, and it shows you the satellites, the stars, the constellations, and the planets in live time. Okay, so we're using that and regular star maps and this object is not there so if the object is not there on a sky or star chart or planetary chart or or, or, or a sky map application then what the hell is it what is it it's now getting larger as each and every day goes by but you know what all of a sudden Everybody is going to be tight lipped except the common man because now everybody knows where to look. And it's coming through just off of Sagittarius. So, again, depending on where you're standing on this earth, but the southwest region of the sky is where this is coming from. And again, I'm going to repeat this again it is not Venus because right now Venus is so low in our sky. This object is much, much higher. And as it's been coming in each and every day, each and every week, it's getting bigger. So what does that tell you? If an object is coming at you and it's getting bigger, it's getting closer. Now, we just took on a gentleman a few weeks ago who wanted to join our group. Very nice man, very educated. We kind of, you know, filtered him in a little bit, and he's been researching this for quite a while. And he used to work in the aerospace industry, and he also is retired from NASA. And he says, you know, I, I want to help you guys. I know, I know all about this. And he, man, he talks like, you know, he talks like, whoo, 
like one of those brainiacs. He tries to put things into common terms for us, but he said that, you know, and, you know. Hey, Scott, I got to jump in real quick. Yeah. Right yes. when you started talking about this gentleman, I'm not kidding you, right when you said you were going to tell us what he said, it got completely wiped out. <laughs> yeah, if I probably figured. So I'll just go over it again real quick. So as, as this gentleman wanted to enter our group, you know, we kind of filtered him in slowly. And he's a very smart, very intelligent man. He worked in the aerospace industry, worked for NASA, worked on a lot of the space shuttle projects. And he definitely knows what's going on. He has specifically said to me, listen, they are tracking a lot of objects, not asteroids and meteors, planets. And I said, well, how many? 13. They've known about all of them throughout the mid-90s, and things really started to heat up as far as getting a bead on these planets, getting coordinates, getting orbits. Uh, some of them are a little erratic, but this one is coming in through Sagittarius. It is in the nighttime sky. People can visualize it at 6.45 p.m. till probably about 10 o'clock. If you look low in the horizon, you'll see Venus to the right. If you look up, you will see this object right here. And we just got these telescopic images from Paul, 245 images. Okay, this object also rotates very, very rapidly, uh, like the like the Qbert star <laughs> that we were looking at. Right. Um, now we took this one and we took out the uh, the color to highlight these craters. And uh, apparently this, this planet has been beat up. I mean, it has literally been beat to hell and back with major craters, uh, you know, throughout its lifespan. I mean, uh, now there was one person who thought that this might be the, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter named Io. Well, it does resemble Io a little bit. However, Io is the size of our moon, and the distance between the Earth and Jupiter is approximately, I think, uh, four, 390 million miles away. So if we're going to be looking at an object the size of the moon, almost 400 million miles away, do you think my backyard astronomer is going to take a telescopic view of that planet with his telescope? Nah, I don't think so. But it does resemble Io. Now, again, you know, I'll just sift through some of these photographs for you. And again, you know, they're not the best quality, but it's just now getting closer to us. And Paul was actually able to, uh, you know, get some of these photographs for us. And they're absolutely amazing. Now, this photograph came in on the 17th that he took, and it clearly shows two other spherical objects behind it. Now, they weren't water droplets. They weren't ice fragments, okay, because these two blue objects, they showed up in other multiple photographs in, in like an orbit around this object. And we've been seeing this blue planet all over the world, not just here in the United States and not through my 10 cent camera, through tens of thousands of people across the globe. So once again, are you going to tell me that everybody's 10 cent camera is broken and they're not seeing this? They're all crazy. Now, I don't think so. So here's another good photograph. This is one of the first that we got in. Now, the two blue objects, the two blue spheres, they don't look like you can see through them. They don't look like water droplets and they sure as hell don't look like reflections. And that yellow planet object, well, it doesn't look like an out-of-focus star. It has craters in it. And that is what's coming at us in the southwest sky right now. Right now. So, we Scott, is there a way to actually, when somebody is recording that and snapping an image with their telescope, to verify the longitude, latitude, all the parameters needed so that it could just take away any speculation. Coordinates. coordinates. Yeah, coordinates. That's, that's what we're working on right now. We are actually working on 
getting these coordinates, and they're going to change, but at least we can get coordinates where you can, well, let's face it, you really don't even need coordinates. All you have to do is go outside and look into the southwest sky, and it's there. It's there. I mean, when we finish up here tonight, or today, Rex, you can step right outside, look into the southwest sky, and say, holy crap, that's what Scott's talking about. That's what tens of thousands and soon to be hundreds and millions of people are going to be looking at and saying, what in the hell is that? Now, there was a few years ago when I saw a video of somebody that was able to take dust and zoom in on it, and it would look like an orb that many times people see in pictures, that, and they'll say, hey, look at all these spirits around me. And I've yeah, also, yeah, now, yeah. let me let me finish too, because I've, I've also seen pictures of people where there were orbs around them, and there's no way that that was dust. But there's a way that you can actually take certain, if you've got a certain camera, you zoom in enough on it. It was, it was a pretty cool video that I saw, the way this guy did it, real easy to do, and I could self-replicate it, I'm sure, quite easily, and so could you and anyone listening to this, pro, uh, this podcast. But it would literally look like those orbs that so many people say are some type of spirit or ghost or something. And what we were just looking at, those planets kind of had that same look to them a little bit. So is there any way that it could be some type of, I don't know, just some anomaly? You know, I mean, not necessarily lens flare or anything like that, but some type of other anomaly. Is that a possibility? Oh, there's always a possibility. There's always a possibility. And as far as going to, uh, to the orbs that you were talking about, um, as, as I said whenever we spoke earlier, um, I've always loved and delved into the paranormal. And uh, I actually have my own paranormal team. And um, That's awesome, I've, man. Yeah, I've examined literally thousands and thousands of orb photographs. I have video of orbs with intelligent movement because a dust particle will not be able to move in a 90-degree turn. It's just impossible. They're not going to move around with an intelligent movement. They're just going to float. And I've examined these orbs extensively. Some of them will look like a cell, like a human skin cell or like a paramecium or an amoeba. They literally look like a cell when you zoom into them. It kind of looks like it has some kind of like little plasma inside. But when you zoom in to these photographs, you can clearly see peaks, valleys. You can see the, um, the, the shading and the shadow of those craters. And those craters are huge. And in one of the, for some reason, I, don't, I, I can't zoom in, I don't think, on this Skype. But when you zoom into this, we were zooming into one of those black dots in a crater. And it looks like the object that impacted is still there with shading and shadow. So on dust, you're really not going to get shading and shadow. Was the lens corrupt? Man, that's some pretty detailed corruption on a lens or the mirror in the telescope. Now, let's forget about these 245 images. I have video footage and more photographs from people all over the world that came in before and after Paul took these telescopic photos and they all match. They just, they're all the same. This photograph or this video footage that you're seeing right on your screen right now, as we were, this was on the 18th of November. Okay. And this was over in Spain. As we were talking about Paul's images, this came up on the Spain Madrid cam, one of our team members happened to be viewing it at that precise moment. That's not the moon. That's not Venus. Look at the direction of where it's going. West, south, south, west. That was our object. And look at the interaction on the planet. Look what's happening to it. Look at the bursts of rays coming off of it. Now, that's not light from another source hitting that planet. That planet has obviously some type of plasma reaction going on. I mean, we're not faking footage. We're just recording it. And we were lucky to capture that. 
And again, you know, I'm not the only one that's seeing this. My subscribers are the best in the world, man. They are the ones that are out there and they are taking the footage, taking the photographs and they're getting them into me and we're examining them. And hey, my idea is proof is in numbers. You know, now this is a good telescopic view that the ladies in Canada took a photograph. The ones I told you that were in Alberta. Uh, 1745 p.m., November 9th, 2016. They call it the new star in the southwest. And there you go. These ladies have a sky map. They have a sky map application for the cell phone, which is a great application to use. They can clearly see Venus off to the right. And then they see that monster. And each and every night, it's there. And as they've been documenting it, it keeps getting closer and it keeps getting bigger. Now, I know that you've interviewed Gil Broussard before. Yeah, Gil, real nice guy. Several times, actually. Yeah. Well, I've had several long conversations with Gil. Um, well, the first time that we talked, we talked for almost four and a half hours. And we have kind of similar backgrounds. And uh, except I'm not a biblical scholar, but uh, <clears throat> we got down to, hey, let's do an interview with each other. So we did my group. We did a Google Hangout. Gil came on. We did an absolutely four hour fabulous interview with him. And the whole video production got somehow corrupted and the footage was all scrap. Nothing. It just we didn't have it. But anyways, the video and the conversation, well, the conversation was fantastic. And I got down to some very specific questions with Gil. And I asked him point blank, I said, Gil, whenever we see this, what's it going to look like? Are we going to be able to distinguish it? And he says, well, at first, you're going to look into the sky and you may notice a new star. And that's all it's going to look like is a bright star off in the distance. And 90% of people will probably just miss it because we don't look up into the sky anymore. We always have our face in our iPad and our cell phone. But he said, as the weeks go by and the months go by, that little tiny dot in the sky will now get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where you will notice it. And some people that live in certain areas of the world will see it first. And now, you know, with technology, the Internet, YouTube, Facebook, people are going to start putting pictures up. And then more and more people are going to start to look into the sky. What's happening right now? Just what Gil said. Just what he said. And I respect that man. I respect that man with everything I have. And the debunkers, they call him a liar. On my radio show on Friday night, we had this debunker that me and you talked about he came on with me and steve olson and we my the the lady who was the host of the radio show had just interviewed john moore she knows john personally she knows gil broussard personally and we asked this gentleman well what do you think about what john moore has to say he said basically john moore is a liar everything that john moore has said in his seminars and his videos are all lies. Just like Dr. Robert Harrington and Carlos Ferrada, ah, they're all liars. They wanted to sell books. They're all liars. So, you know, me and Steve took very serious offense to it because I respect John Moore. I respect everything that he stands for. And I respect his bravery to come out and talk about the things that he knows about. And well, I've talked to John a couple times also, and I like John. He's a nice guy. He seems like a straight shooter. He's had some very prestigious positions in the military and law enforcement. So, But would you call him a liar? Like I said, I absolutely <laughs> not. I wouldn't call him a liar. I like John. So yeah. you know, here's the thing, and that's I don't, I don't appreciate when people come out and just say, hey, that guy's a liar. That guy's full of it. Now, so, people can be wrong, and that's cool, but if somebody's wrong— Say, hey, look, this is why I feel that you're wrong and do it in a respectable manner because what good is calling somebody a liar going to do anyway? That's just going to piss the other person off, rightfully so, Absolutely. and then it's just going to start a fight. So, if you, you know, I think that 
negotiation is key on both sides of people say, hey, look, you think I'm a liar? Well, instead of calling me a liar, why don't you say, hey, this is why I think you're wrong. And then you get together, you have a conversation, you end up either making a friend, an acquaintance, or hey, you know, I mean, it is what it is. But it just fascinates me because with Leak Project, there's so many different people that listen to Leak Project on all sides of the the coin, you know, and they'll the comments on both sides, it's just like, wow, you guys could probably get together and have a decent conversation if you didn't just start leaving comments about you're an a-hole, you're this, you're that, you're this. I mean, it's psychology. You call somebody a name, it's automatically going to piss them off. What are they supposed to do? Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've been through it. I've 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 been invited into some of these hangouts with the debunkers and the trolls, and I was the only one who had backbone to go in against a half a dozen of them by myself. And I went at it with them for three and a half hours. I went at it with them, and the 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 only excuses that they had were the same excuses that everybody just washes out. That's a lens flare. That's a photographic anomaly. Uh, and then, you know, the the amateur astronomer who we call Astro Boy, who has his own YouTube channel. He's supposed to be an amateur astronomer, super good with mathematics, does a spreadsheet of this big mathematical equation and says to me, here is my answer. Check my math. Well, Rex, I'm not a mathematician. I don't trust math. Science can be wrong. Astronomers can be wrong. The same as a doctor can make a misdiagnosis. So if you have two mathematicians going at this huge chalkboard size mathematical equation, they can come out with two different answers. And who the hell knows if they're right or wrong? Can I check that math? Hell no. So I got to take that spreadsheet. I got to take it to a college. I got to ask a professor if he could check the math on this. And then I have to trust his abilities. So what? He's human. He can be wrong, just like just like any other <clears throat> mathematician. And at the same time, you got to give him props for coming out with that, because here's another thing, too. If somebody genuinely believes that is correct, hey, man, bring it to the table. That's awesome. I mean, I talk to people all the time that don't have the same beliefs as me, and that's fantastic. I don't know anybody that I agree with 100% of the time. That would be weird. But, you know, also take into account there's usually two sides. You know, I mean, and a lot of times when somebody's really extreme on the left, somebody's really extreme on the right, you'll find kind of a balance in the middle. So, you know, maybe there is some good data to that math. You know, I mean, maybe that, that math is accurate or not. I don't know. I haven't seen it. So I, I just think that sometimes people are too quick to call somebody a troll or a shill when in reality they're not. They're just, you know, that's who they are. That's what they believe. And you would agree with that, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. Well, here's the thing. You know, as far as the trolling goes, if, if I see you in the comment section of any of my YouTube videos for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you don't even have time to go to the bathroom. How are you paying your bills? when you're on my YouTube channel 24 seven. Maybe they're on social security, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got my welfare check coming in next month, man. Check this out. I'm going to type all over this guy's channel, man. He's freaking me out. They, they, they beat my channel to death. And, um, you know, I mean, my subscribers, they argue with them all the time. They have the same excuses. It's the same bunch. And then, you know, I'm no dummy. You know, I investigate them. I investigate the trolls and I ended up finding them on the gentleman who debunks my videos. I find them in one of his video comments and they're all there in the comment section on Google plus all together collaborating and, you know, going through their sabotage against me. And I caught him, caught him several times. So now, you know, I flush them out. I make fun of them. I tell them I'm going to barbecue them. You know, I'm going to spread barbecue sauce all over you, baby. When the world comes to an end and I'm looking for something to eat, I'm going to find one of you trolls. And I'm going to barbecue you. You know, but in reality, I'm just joking around with them. But uh, I feel that they do have an agenda. Their agenda is to discredit me, discredit the information, and create a doubt in the subscriber's mind. So if you create the doubt, yeah, well, then you've done your job. But every single video that I put up within seconds, they have notifications set up 
they're on my video within five to 10 seconds in the comment section spewing their hatred. That's a troll. That's well, a professional. And I'll tell you, I mean, with the profession that you had for over 20 years being in advertising, the marketing and advertising realms are very <laughs> manipulative. And you have to know psychology, neurolinguistic programming, conversational hypnosis, body language, and all the other stuff in between. And if you grasp all that, then you'll understand marketing and advertising quite well. So you brought up some good points there. And I can certainly see advertising now at a whole other level. I mean, you've got some MK Ultra stuff mixed in with advertising now, which goes right to the subconscious. And how many people fall asleep with the TV in the background when they're even more susceptible to subliminal programming? And it's just at a whole other level. So you can probably pick that stuff out quite easily with the experience that you have. Yeah, absolutely. And I studied all of that. I mean, I was I would consider myself one of the best in the business. I mean, I invented the Budweiser girls. Uh -huh. I had I had massive contracts with um, NASCAR, Carnival Cruise Lines. I've been all over the world, man. I've I've bumped heads with some of the biggest uh, corporations, and I've literally, you know, sat down in front of them, in front of their advertising board, and I put out the numbers, I put out the the you know the ad campaign, the psychology of the ad campaign, and the target market, and I've walked away with twenty five to fifty million dollar contracts. So I'm no pushover. I'm no idiot. I'm, I'm no you know dummy that just decided to open up a YouTube channel and do this. And I knew there was going to be a target on my back. It took about 90 days. But, you know, whatever. Come get me. But. Who came up with the spud dog? The spud dog? Yeah, spud oh, McKenzie. Oh, you mean uh, spud, <laughs> uh, spuds. That was way after me. The Budweiser girls was actually a joke. <laughs> because it was it, it turned out to be a joke that like came up and you know like sex sales and we were right in the middle of these big Budweiser contract negotiations with Budweiser and NASCAR and um, my it was my father's company and my my father had a young girlfriend that um, she looked like um, um, she looked like um, what's her name Pamela Anderson. And her name was Cherie, very beautiful woman, complete airhead. And she came walking in as I was having a meeting with my father and she was dressed in little white shorts, had a little red shirt on and it just happened to be a Budweiser shirt. And it was, you know, all skin tight, all tanned out. And she was like, you know, you know that, that little bubbly attitude. And I looked over at her and I was like, oh my God, you know, that light bulb went off because that's the type of mind that I have when it comes to you know, advertising. And uh, I was like, wow, that's it. She's a Budweiser girl. And my father looked at me, he says, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, we're going to, we're going to create the Budweiser girls. These girls are going to sell beer. Who drinks beer? Guys. What do guys want to look at? <laughs> they want to look at, you know, <laughs> supermodels dressed in little skimpy shorts. And we're going to take this to NASCAR. And we did. And it went off like a bombshell. And we had a five-year deal, and I went to every single race five years in a row with the Budweiser girls. And, um, you know, they ended up being models for modeling agencies in the specific cities and states uh, where the races were. And uh, it went off like a, you know, like a charm. And it was worth the $25 million, you know. And, uh, but that's how it is. You know, you get these light bulbs that go off in your head, and um, this is what's happened with me. And this whole Planet X. Now, I'm starting to find out and figure out that the whole label of Planet X, Nibiru, is just that. It's just a label right now. Because what I'm finding out is there is a hell of a lot more out there than some rogue planet. And, you know, you can call this inside information, call it whatever you want, believe it, don't believe it. But there's more out there than everyone on the face of this planet knows about. And the day's going to come when it's going to be undeniable. There are way too many things happening on the earth right now that you can't just overlook. You know, all of this earthquake activity, my debunker says, oh, that's silly, mate, my old chap, blah, blah, blah. Well, he just suffered a magnitude 7.8 magnitude earthquake in New Zealand 
literally the land just lifted up literally out of the ocean onto the shores and he just says it's just uh it just happens naturally yeah it does happen naturally in new zealand so far it's happened over 42,000 times this year as earthquake activity is an all-time high that you could ask gil broussard we discussed that the earth's core is heating up these planets that may be near us they're pretty strong as far as their magnetic energy and uh you know what it's like when you put two magnets together you know one is going to be a little stronger a little larger and it's, it's going to pull on the other planet it's going to pull our tectonic plates apart and we're going to start to shift and we're going to start to shake and we're going to start to shimmy and we're already doing that volcanic activity it's now increasing so i mean how much more does the naysayer want they want to walk outside and look into the sky and say, oop, there it is. Well, you know what? You're going to get that opportunity. You're going to get it. And then what are you going to do? You're going to crap your pants. You know, one of my messages on my channel was, hey, let's get prepared. Let's start learning something. I, my, I have a saying that is, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. The more you know, the more power you have. You may have listened to something on my channel that may save your life one day, that may help you make a decision in a life-threatening moment to protect your family, to protect yourself. But I still get kicked in the nuts because I do what I do. Is it wrong to be prepared? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to question things? Absolutely not. I question everything. Well, you know what's interesting, Scott? Real quick, let me jump in. It's like you have to have all these different insurances or else you get fined now. Yet exactly. for somebody that wants to have tangible insurance like food, clean water, you know, maybe a, another shelter source or some type of structure that's strong enough to deal with certain cataclysms, being able to get off the grid, stuff like that. No, no, you don't want to have any of that, you know, but you do want to have your corporatocracy insurance. There, there's so many variables to everything that we talk about and everything that we delve into. I mean, and I do sit by some days and... Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I have some moments, you know, because I wish there was something that I could do more, you know, I mean, I, I, I read all of the emails that come in. Uh, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but what I'm trying to say is let's start getting out there and let's all start forming our own investigations. Don't believe me, believe what you find out, believe your own investigations believe your own photographs, start doing it yourself, and then collaborate with me by sending your photographs in with me, and let's take a look at this, because you may uncover some very credible information, and that's what I do. And I get kicked in the teeth for it every single day, but that's okay, it's okay, I'm used to it. No big deal. <laughs> Living <laughs> no the dream. <laughs> yeah, right, you know, and I mean, look, man, I should be, well, I was retired, you know, I'm out cruising my Harley in the spring of the summer and I'm just, you know, I'm having a good time and I don't need to make money. You know, I don't need a, I don't need a job because I, I've done my share of work. You know, I'm still in great health, great shape. And uh, I just wanted to enjoy my life. And then I think about, well, hell, I'm only 48 years old. This may be the longest I'm going to live. So if that's the case, then I'm going to have to fight. And I've always been a fighter, you know, I'm not confrontational, but, you know, I will fight for what I believe in. And that I truly East Coast believe, attitude. That's it, baby. But I truly believe in what I'm doing. Now, I'm going to jump into something that I get, ugh, I get beat to death for. Oh, you're in this for the money. Okay. Yeah. I'm in this for the money. Like I've told these trolls and these debunkers, look, buddy. If I wanted to, I could go out to a BMW dealership tomorrow morning and I could drop 65K on a brand new BMW. Can you? So it's not about the money. And you know as well as I do that YouTube does not pay you like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for your content. So, 
yeah, my videos are monetized and they're monetized for a reason is because Google and YouTube are advertising companies first and foremost. That's what they do. They're advertising companies. I was in the heyday selling banner advertisement on the internet when these trolls were still running around in their little pissy pant diapers. I was in the beginning stages of the internet craze and advertising. So in order for my algorithm to be, you know, uh, produced, increased, and to put me out front, I have to be monetized. And according to the last amount of money that I received from uh, YouTube, from Google, <laughs> compared to the hours that I put in, seven days a week, I'm making $2.29 an hour. That's it. Now, two twenty nine. <laughs> that's big money, man. <laughs> Buy a yacht, two twenty nine an hour. Jeez, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, I figured it out quite quite a long time ago because um, you know they have that one uh, internet website called Social Blade, and it lists that's all a pretty of cool the, site. Uh, it lists all of the uh, YouTube channels on and your projections of what you're going to be making. And somehow they had me up there making $149,000. Listen, if I knew that I could make 150 K off of YouTube, I would have been doing something on YouTube a long time ago. Okay. But you know, it's, it's not about the money. It's not about the money. This has nothing to do about money because very shortly currency, it's not going to be worth anything. We're not going to be using money. The banking systems are failing now as it is. You know, so we have so many variables and so many things that are falling in place. It's almost to the point now where, you know, how can you deny it? How can you deny it? I mean, I, I'm not perfect. The, um, you know, the information that I get, I have to discern, you know, what's credible and what's not every now and then I get taken to the bank, you know, uh, like I did a video on the, uh, the, the, um, the earthquake in New Zealand and the small tsunami. And I was genuinely concerned about what was happening down there. Did a quick video on it. And, uh, I have a lot of subscribers in New Zealand. They were sending me photographs. One individual sent me a photograph of a small tsunami footage that was rolling in eh, like a little ripple, you know, in, in inland. And um, I didn't check the video. It was recorded off of YouTube from 2010 when they had another earthquake and another small tsunami. I didn't check the video information. I scooted about, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 seconds of it in my video while my debunker who lives in New Zealand was on it like blue bonnet. Scott's a fear monger. Scott's a liar. Scott is deceiving the world. Wow. Really? Like I created those landslides in your country. I uplifted the highways. Okay. Yeah. Scott did it all, you know, but yeah, I get deceived every now and then when I have an emergency situation like that, like in Italy and what happened in New Zealand. Yeah. I want to get the word out. I want people to know, you know, I'm not a news channel, but you know, it's kind of how it is. And uh, anything that I do, they jump on immediately. They have been assigned to me, Rex bottom line. They are assigned to me. Well, but uh, the pho photograph you're looking at, that's that asteroid that is stuck in the orbit around the Earth. That's the one I wanted to show you. I just happened to see it. Man, I'll tell you, that is a very interesting image. And you go through a lot, Scott. I appreciate the time you put into it and all the effort you have You know, really brought to the table with the subscribers and the people that are a part of your channel that listen to you regularly. And for those that have a chance to listen to this podcast, I mean, I would definitely recommend if you're interested, check out the Nibiru Planet X 2016 YouTube channel. And anything else that you would like to share with us, Scott, before we close out tonight? And once again, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I mean, I do want to say that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that we do have a celestial threat to our planet if you watch very carefully what your own government is doing in your country especially if you live in a, in a modern country Europe the United States Canada 
if you watch what these governments are doing, then you'll clearly see that they are in direct preparation. They constantly produce psyops, psychological operations, to see how the public is going to react to a situation that will be upcoming. All of this summer, there was the big issue, grab the guns, disarm America. Well, that didn't work. But everywhere you look, if you watch what the government does, you don't even have to watch this guy. Watch these people, and that will tell you something's up. Something is up. And there are many, many credible men and women that have dedicated their time and their life to this investigation. Like Gil Broussard and John Moore, Steve Quill, uh, you know, Robert Evans, myself, Steve Olson. You know, there are a lot of people out there putting themselves out there, putting a target on their back to divulge this information. Why? Hell. We love humanity, we love this earth, and we don't think that we should be lied to. We think that we should be given the chance to prepare and have the same chance as the elite. And that's what I'm gonna fight for to the very end. That's it, bottom line, that is my fight. Right on, man. That's awesome, Scott. Once again, really appreciate you coming on with us. Please keep us updated. Folks, check out Nibiru, Planet X, 2016 YouTube. Looks like daily updates, sometimes even more than one. Also, check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Get access to over 350 full feature podcasts, absolutely free. And if you become a contributing member at leapproject.com, you'll get access to exclusive content. Check out our new high resolution limited vinyl decals for 10 bucks, free shipping, and be the change you want to see. This is Rex Bear. Talk to you soon. And gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and we have special guest Scott Sion with us from Nibiru, Planet X 2016. Now, this channel has just skyrocketed over the past several months. He has accumulated over 32,000 astute members and subscribers and people that are helping him out finding the infamous Planet X Nibiru, the Wing Destroyer, the Red Kachina Nemesis, the Binary Star, the Dark Star, whatever name you want to put behind this heavenly body that's been talked about for thousands of years. Now, this is also a very controversial subject. I've noticed that during the past year that I've done Leak Project, we've had people from around the world on a wide variety of subjects, and it seems like Planet X and Nibiru is definitely the most controversial. Whether you love it or hate it, you're going to have something to say. And as you guys know that have been following us here at Leak Project, we have an open platform. We are neutral as we can be on most of the topics. I know you guys know I'm pretty passionate about certain things with vaccines and stuff. But when it comes to Planet X and Nibiru, I am agnostic, which means I just don't no. Uh, do I believe there's a Planet X out there? Yes, absolutely. Do I believe that it's Nibiru? I don't know. I, I don't know. So Scott is going to share some great information with us today. He reached out to us and said, look, I've got some awesome data footage and we're going to see it here at Leak Project. Scott, it's an honor to speak with you. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex, what's happening, my man? Hey, living the dream. You know, I mean, this is this is awesome. I love data and it's great to speak with people like you. So what do you got for us? Well, we have a whole storyline. Um, I mean, this all started for me back in 1989 when I was in college. Uh, I was at the University of Miami, and uh, a professor of mine mentioned this Planet X material way back then. It was just a, a topic of conversation in class. And ever since then, I've been, you know, I've been investigating it. I've been keeping up on it. We had a very large period of time where there was literally no information or very little information. And I was kind of moving on with my life. And then over the past several years, more and more information has been coming out. And, you know, with the uh, with the platforms like YouTube and Facebook, uh, this information has now come out in droves. Uh, YouTube channels, researchers, investigators, whatever you want to call them. So I decided to start listening in. And once I started listening in, and then I started doing my own homework and my own investigations. 
I started to find that a lot of this material uh, had a lot of credibility to it. And, you know, I started watching, you know, a little bit about the government, the FEMA camps, the underground bunkers, the whole nine yards. I've never been a big fan of, of them, but um, I started investigating all this myself. And I couldn't come up to any other conclusions other than governments around the world are preparing for something. And I don't think it's nuclear war because there isn't a winner in nuclear war. I mean, I, I came to that conclusion many, many years ago. You know, you, you fire off a nuclear weapon, I fire off a nuclear weapon, and we wipe out the world. So what good comes from it? So I felt that the governments around the world were literally preparing for something. And when I was putting the two and two together, I figured, okay, well, let me get back into this Planet X. And Planet X was basically, you know, the Roman numeral for, for number 10. Uh, it wasn't like the X Factor or the X Files. It was literally the 10th planet, according to Dr. Robert Harrington. And uh, whenever I started getting into Dr. Harrington's research and Carlos Ferrada and many others back in that era, these were incredible men and very intelligent men. And I've come to find over this, this past year that there are so many people out there that just want to debunk this information, they they call Robert Harrington an idiot. He was wrong. Carlos Ferrada, uh, a charlatan, a prophet. He had no idea what he was talking about. His mathematical equations were wrong. So I respect these men. I respect their research. And I followed some of the research. And... Um, I started listening to uh, Gil Broussard, who is, uh, an, again, another very intelligent man, biblical scholar in my eyes. And once I started following uh, Gil Broussard's findings in the Bible, and I started putting all of that together, I really started to think, okay, there has to be something there. These timelines that Gil has put together, the timelines of events from four or five, 6,000 years ago, you know, these ancient people just didn't make this up all over the world. They documented it. And we have the proof. We have the evidence. The Chinese wrote it down. And their language hasn't changed in 6,000 years. So the actual writings that Gil Broussard discovered, they were very easy to translate. The language hasn't changed. And uh, I began... I began searching and searching, and then I decided to uh, go to YouTube, and um, I felt everyone in this world has the right to know what's going on because, I mean, let's be honest, uh, some of these events with the Earth over the, you know, over the centuries have been catastrophic. Many people have died, and now that we are in modern times, I feel the, the destruction will be even more. Because we are now modern man. We're not ancient man. We have huge cities. We have, you know, utility services underground. I mean, we have big buildings, bridges, and the population of the world is much larger also. And, you know, uh, tens of millions of people are inhabiting the coastlines all around the world. So in the event of anything like this, the possibilities of massive amounts of people dying in the first 24 hours is unbelievable. So I decided to dive in and try to do my part. And believe me, I get nailed left and right every single day for doing what I do. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, and some of the stuff you shared with me off the air, I think, is just, it's incredible that you've persevered through that much, because a lot of people would just be like, look, I'm done. And I find it fascinating why people get so upset about Planet X sometimes. You know, I hear the old, oh, well, it's a fear-mongering thing, and I do see people that use fear tactics to, to profit, and I don't like it. I mean, there's plenty of people I can see on TV that make millions on that. And I'm like, well, why don't you guys go after those donkeys? You know, I mean, <laughs> they're doing a lot more damage on the air saying that Jesus is going to save you right now if you give them a thousand dollars of as much money as you can. I'm being not a little bit sarcastic, but not completely here because you do see that stuff on TV a lot where you've got the wolves in sheep's clothing and the stuff that you've gone through just to make people aware of what you feel is a possible cataclysmic event. You know, I mean, that's you're putting yourself on the line and. 
I know people that have ostracized themselves from their family because of what they believe in, whether it's Planet X or something similar to Fringe like that, you know, when Fukushima has so many attacks from people that they care about because of what they're doing. And it's like, you know, they're doing it because they believe in it, yet they're getting attacked. And it kind of reminds me of some of those superhero comic books where the, you know, they have to go, the, the good guys, the ones that go through all the crap and the bad guys, the ones that have the nice house, the nice cars, all the money, etc. It's like, well, why do you want to be a good guy when you can be the villain and, and get all this stuff? Exactly. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a glamorous, uh, I call, I'll call it a job because right now that's what, I mean, I've retired from, um, the advertising and marketing industry, you know, 22 years and I've traveled around the world and I know people all over the world. And, um, this is, I guess this is where I'm getting my passion. Uh, I feel that, that we, as a people, the inhabitants of this planet, I think we deserve more. I mean, don't you, I mean, I don't want to get caught with my pants down in, in the event of something this serious. So yeah, you know, I'll take the punches in the throat. You know, I'll take the knives in the back because that is pretty much what it's been two months after my channel started. Um, I started stumbling onto some very good, credible information. And my whole theory was, OK, I need to have as many eyes in the sky as I possibly can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the people that subscribe to my channel and in my videos to please go out there and let's photograph the sun let's photograph the sky in the day in the night in the afternoon i want to photograph it from around the world because eventually someone's going to start capturing something so you know it's like all of the observatories all over the globe okay eventually they all have their telescopes fired up and they're looking into different areas of space well the same applies for us little people we can get our eyes in the skies and we could start to uncover what might possibly be there and it's worked it's worked in a fantastic way. And the subscribers to my channel are, are some of the best people walking this earth. These people are absolutely beautiful. And then they've come to protect me. If, you know, I was putting up four five, six videos a day because I had so much information coming in. And there'd come a day where, okay, I would take a little break or I had a function to go to and I didn't put a video up. I would literally get a thousand emails Scott, are you okay? Is everything okay? You didn't, you didn't upload a video. We're worried about you. And then, you know, you know, we love you. We, we respect you. We're right behind you. And that's what I wanted. I wanted people to, to, to make a stand. I don't, I don't want to see everyone stick their head between their legs and just take it because we don't have to, you know, your ancestors and mine and everybody else's, we built this planet. We built it. We live on it. It's our baby. It's not a government baby. It's not a government planet. It belongs to us. And, you know, that's my whole, that's my whole theory. You know, okay, we built this planet. We inhabit it. Okay, you know, human beings aren't perfect, but we all, we all don't deserve to have the sheets pulled over our eyes, all of our money taken for the elite to run and hide in their golden bunkers and then come outside a few months later when things may be all clear and then try to start their whole new world order. Well, it's not going to happen on my watch, brother. It's just not going to happen. And uh, I've done a lot of organizing over the past nine months and I've done a, done a lot of networking over the past year. And the information that has come into my channel which is every single day is absolutely amazing. Now I have to sift through it. And yes, we have the dreaded lens flare because the debunkers love that. I think that's the only word that they have in their vocabulary is lens flare. But I have team members that literally help me out with different avenues um, dealing with this subject. And as we were speaking, I have a friend of mine, he's a photographer, 25 years, owns his own studio, very professional, top notch equipment. I had him start looking, you know, look at photographs for me. And, uh, you know, he taught me a lot uh, about uh, what to look for in these photographs. But then when I started showing him photographs that were off the wall, he started to say to me, hey, where are you getting these photographs? And I said, oh, you know, don't worry about it, but just tell me, what is that in, in, in the photograph? He says, well, that's a, that's a solid object. That's, a, that's something, a planet, something near the sun. 
you know, and as I started documenting things all through this past summer, June, July, August, September, uh, you know, he made a believer out of himself just by looking at the footage and the, and the, um, the photographs and video. And then I had some people, subscribers who are ex-military, they're retired, um, they know a lot, they've actually come on board with me. And it's fantastic. I, I have some people in North Carolina, I've got some in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, and uh, out on the West Coast in California. And that does not even include all of the people that I have in European countries, South America, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, even Eastern Europe. Now, there are a bunch of countries that I don't hear from because they're very highly censored. I've only heard from a few people in Russia, um, a few people you know, in Japan, but um, as far as all of Europe, well, they pretty much keep in contact with me on a daily basis. What uh, part of Europe, sorry to interrupt, Scott, what part of Europe would you say is the most popular for images that you're getting? Uh, Germany was very popular, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, uh, the northern tier of Italy. Um, now, Switzerland, all of a sudden, all the contacts that I had there, they can't see my YouTube channel anymore. Same thing with Belgium, Denmark, Germany's very rough now. Holland, a matter of fact, I just got an email 4.30 this morning from one of my uh, Dutch uh, associates over there, and uh, we test things on YouTube. Uh, they're not getting notifications for my newly uploaded videos, and they literally have to use a bookmark to go back to the YouTube channel. Well, you also were saying that you've got some pretty good connections as far as credible data, and you put together this folder for us that you're going to share and I, I can't wait to see what you got man i'm excited yeah yeah absolutely um i mean i've been working very closely me and steve olson we, we talk several times a day i like um, steve we, yeah steve's a good guy we we started to collaborate on uh some things in the middle of the summer and he was very busy i was very busy uh we just exchanged some emails and i had so many overloaded photographs and he was touching on some things that I was investigating and uh, Jeff P and Chris Potter, and it had to do with the sun simulator, this, this whole fake sun theory. And all of a sudden I had a German subscriber who is an old time photographer. She still uses the older 35 millimeter camera with film, like real 35 millimeter film <laughs> and uh, a very massive telescopic lens on this camera. And she develops her own uh, film. And here's the thing. And me and Steve finally came to a conclusion on this. Whenever you're looking at photographs taken in a digital form and then photographs on film, when you zoom into them, they don't pixelize the 35 millimeter film. And, you know, some of the photographs that she was getting me, um, they were absolutely fantastic. And this had to do with the, Fres the Fresnel lens. I believe when Steve was on with you the last time, he was explaining it to you. Well, I came up with the first photograph of it, and it's almost like an X-ray photograph, a special way that this lady takes photographs and develops them. This Fresnel lens came out of the sky, and I looked at it. I did a video about it, and it just so happens um, a, uh, a subscriber from Sweden who has an interest in lighthouses knew what this lens was what it was called what it was used for and they were used for oh my god you're you're talking very old technology going back to who i think late 1800s 1900s the fresnel lens uh, it was used in tail lights of cars in the 50s and 60s uh, but they use it as a reflecting glass lens for the lighthouse so he gave you all the information i did the background and don't you know that lens matched up with my picture. And then we started getting more photographs from people showing this anomaly and this lens in their photographs. Well, whenever I took this to my photographer friend, he's like, nah, that cannot be uh, something within the camera. He said, that's actually a reflected object in that photograph. And then when we started putting it all together, and we were viewing those FAA weather cams up in Alaska, 
um, we were actually seeing that anomaly, that figure in these photographs. And then uh, between all of us, we put it together. But discovering that Fresnel lens was the key factor because we could have just went on and on and on with theories. And one of the theories that we had, there's a few things that are going on as far as a sun simulator. A sun simulator is definitely a possibility. But if you've noticed, the sun